Okay, well, let's uh, kick off. Um, my name is James Governor. Um, uh, I'm glad you could uh, join us today. I uh, just want to make sure you can all, let's see, I assume you can see my slides. Oh, no, wait, actually, you probably can't see my slides. Let me just, uh, let me just wake up a little bit, share my screen. Just having a bit of a slow moment this afternoon. Okay. Again. Right, now you see my slides. So, uh, my name is James Governor. I am the co-founder of a research company called Redmonk. I'm here for a conversation today um, with Milos Rusic from uh, DeepSet. And really the theme is that um, we're all trying to crack on and start building AI driven applications. But what we've seen in a lot of organizations is either fear is getting in the way or they don't have the right ownership and the right approaches to actually start delivering uh, value in one of the most exciting um, areas of tech that we've seen probably uh, since the introduction of the cloud. So November 30th, uh, 2022. Um, yeah, a, a, a banner day. Uh, because everything changed. That was the introduction of ChatGPT, which was a bit of a, um, uh, should we say, a uh, you only live once, a YOLO moment for the industry. And um, we've been talking about these large language models and how we can get them into people's hands. Um, there was a concern uh, that perhaps they weren't quite ready, but ChatGPT and OpenAI uh, decided, decided to get on with it. Um, and it was a, a rocket, essentially. By February, Reuters was saying that this was the fastest uh, growing consumer product that they'd ever tracked. Um, you know, you were getting into tens of millions of, of people using this very, very quickly. And I think what was interesting to me was, you know, very often previously to that, AI had been something that we thought about would be practitioner driven. Um, so it wouldn't necessarily be driven by end users at that level. The fact that an end user would understand a prompt um, was was a big deal. When uh, my colleagues, and in fact, my colleagues' parents started to use the application, I knew something was afoot. Um, this year has just been AI, AI, and AI. I track uh, a lot of companies um, and, and how they're trying to move forward with their strategies. And certainly that, that introduction of ChatGPT was the classic Mike Tyson, everybody has a plan until they get uh, punched in the face. So by the end of the year, by end of 2023, um, you know, here we were um, with uh, GitHub Universe and uh, Thomas Domke, the CEO, was saying that we are refounding the company on Copilot. So Copilot is the code completion project um, uh, from uh, GitHub, and it's been the fastest growing project that they've ever seen. In fact, not project, I say product. So they've driven a significant amount of sales, huge success for them. And literally, they say they're refounding the company around that. Um, literally, uh, a few days later at Microsoft Ignite, uh, you had Satya Nadella, the CEO and CEO of Microsoft, say our vision is pretty straightforward. We are the co-pilot company. We believe in a future where there'll be a co-pilot for everyone and everything you do. Again, this is a company refounding statement from Microsoft around the idea that these co-pilots We'll be touching not just developers like the GitHub Copilot, but we'll be touching everyone in business. So everybody is going to be using Copilot with their productivity applications, with their 
uh, business and data analytics um, with uh, Microsoft Dynamics. So it's going to be across the board. We're going to be using Copilot with Windows. Um, a few days later, uh, everything goes wrong. Sam Altman is ousted by the board. And we start to wonder, is this a phenomenon that we can trust? We get a little bit scared. Um, by the end of the weekend, he's back again. Satya Nadella was probably pretty happy about that, given this co-pilot statement. Again, uh, uh, obviously, Amazon Web Services, huge company, had been a little bit on the back foot this year because of this transformation around OpenAI. Um, but at reInvent last week, they stood up and started announcing what they called Q, which is their version of co-pilots. So they're going to be using chat-based um, interfaces. They're going to be uh, surfacing in both the technology. So, you know, say you've got a query about CDK and you want to uh, provision some infrastructure, you can use Q to do that. Or as a business story, again, tying into all of the data sources with plugins to the likes of Salesforce and Slack. So this, this the, 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 the biggest companies in the tech industry have had to move extremely quickly this year because everything is in play. Now, when you move really quickly, that's great because you can make uh, users happy, you can make them excited. But what happens if there's a hallucination? What happens if, and we saw this very quickly, some um, experts from the Amazon field, um, in, in terms of, of people that know the infrastructure very well, are asking a question and Q is giving exactly the wrong answer. Now, I don't want to pick on Q, but again, uh, there was a story about some some issues, not just about hallucinations, but also perhaps that there was some information about data centers that had leaked um, through Q into the public. Obviously, that's not what we want. But if we think about Amazon, and, and uh, as I say, I don't want to pick on them. Amazon had to deliver something. It had to deliver something quickly to market. It needed to be in play. And I think we 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 would expect that there were going to be some teething um, issues. But obviously, this is also something we need to work on. And enterprises may have some different considerations. Samsung bans the use of generative AI tools because they had a leak where um, some of their, their customers have been using uh, these applications and had found that information, again, had leaked to become public. Not what you want as an enterprise, certainly not a regulated industry. But speed is everything. And I think what we've really seen is this excitement that now we're able to move forward and build applications more quickly. And certainly for developers that may be a little bit less concerned on those specific issues, the, the new stack of tools that they've got available to build things is very, very exciting. And developer excitement is where we get a huge amount of benefit to the business. Because we want that iPhone moment. We want that moment when we have a platform, we can start to get really excited. We can start to get those network effects. Um, previous wave, of, I shouldn't say previous, I mean, these are still extremely important, but if we think about platforms like NPM or Docker and the Docker Hub or GitHub indeed, there are social implications to moving forward quickly. Um, and, and, and the sorts of platforms really benefit from network effects. So what are we gonna have from an AI perspective? New names have emerged, things like Langchain, Hugging Face, OpenAI from its AI driven um, uh, perspective, very quickly they moved to plugins, which they announced their recent event and again, platforms like Haystack from DeepSet. The, the, the key thing here that we want to talk about today is the transition from project to product. This is not about discrete IT-driven projects. This is about a product mindset because we're talking about very often B2C applications, B2B applications, but it's got to be driven from the perspective of the digital product. But who does that? Are organizations or enterprises really set up for that? I mean. Are we really going to, in fact, we've seen this, we've seen organizations have a, a VP of AI um, and, and then they end up in a silo, but that's really not going to work. We have to have AI as something that all product owners are thinking about and all digital product teams are thinking about what are the opportunities that they can drive more value and transformative value to their customers. One of the issues we've had is that their machine learning wave, it looked a bit like waterfall. You know, you'd have your scientists would build a model and then they'd throw it over the fence for someone else to use. AI and where we're going, it's really going to have to be used, move to a more agile mindset. And it's going to have to be something where feedback um, comes back in, in terms of those feedback loops so that we can deliver more value to the customers. And I think it looks more, the AI wave that we're currently seeing is definitely looking more like software engineering and less like um, science. So 
data sovereignty. Data sovereignty is a real concern. Privacy and intellectual property. The opportunity is too big to miss. Open source and on-prem become issues there. Let's really think about data sovereignty. What are the models that we can use? Who's in charge of your AI projects? We can't take this chief AI officer approach. We need to avoid hallucinations. Um, retrieval augmented generation is one of the ways that we can move forward there. We're now hearing a little bit, out, bit about small language models. Not everybody needs an LLM for all of the problems. This doesn't need to be big data. We're not all gonna spend all of our money on Hadoop again and not get the value that we expected or hoped. Focus has to be the digital product and feedback loops, not ML ops. And I think at that point, it's time for me to stop ranting and introduce you to Milos Rusic from um, DeepSet. And uh, Milos, you've been having a lot of conversations uh, with enterprises this year um, about these issues. You've got a, a strong opinion. And so, yeah, I think the first question for you is, what's why does it need to be a product management mindset? Surely, why is that so important in terms of success in this space? First of all, James, thanks a lot uh, for um, for uh, having me on this conversation. Um, and to directly dive in why we need a product management mindset for AI and for the adoption of AI, I think, um, so there are probably two angles to it, right? The first one is what we ultimately build with AI are mostly, um, and maybe I diminish AI now a little bit, but these are mostly features, right? Into, into, into products that we're already using today. Um, probably some of these capabilities that we see with AI are, you know, substantially changing the way the whole product should be built. Uh, but if you think about using AI for question answering chatbots and customer support, right? It is still somehow embedded within, you know, a customer support product that doesn't just contain this one AI capability or AI mm -hmm. feature, but it's actually the whole experience about, okay, you know, I'm asking now questions, how are they represented? Uh, which other information do I want, right? To really support the customer support process, because probably it's not just the information the chatbot spits out, but maybe I want to see the source ticket. Maybe I want some text around it, resolution times. There's a lot of stuff still, right? That is, let's call it like non-AI product, right? That needs to be in place to really, you know, to really make AI uh, or get AI adopted. Let me tell you one, one brief story here. So, we are having actually quite many customers from the publishing space. And um, of course, publishers uh, who are selling content, right? Who are selling textual or like image information for them, for them, these new capabilities are in particular interesting. Many of our customers succeed very quickly with the technical feature and solution. You know, let's say question answering, generative question answering on their data. You can ship something quite fast. and you know the capabilities the technology is mature enough the problem is now in my existing let's say newspaper app mm -hmm. how do i make effective use of question answering such that i reach my business goals which are again you know uh engagement on my website time spent on my content how does this contribute to it right and this means it's not an isolated ai technology challenge right how to mm -hmm. build that feature. It's more about how to embed it in the full product. The second angle to the product management mindset is to achieve it, you cannot really be waterfall. I would say building AI features um, by nature is um, like, so my background is I'm a machine learning engineer or actually mathematician and then you know somehow moved into machine learning. And mm -hmm. machine learning, we are, as machine learning engineers, we are very familiar with the term of experimentation. For us, this right. is, uh, a very natural phase of the development life cycle of machine learning models, right? That means machine learning and building machine learning features or AI features is by default always an agile process. You cannot really, you know, waterfall your way to 90% performance or satisfaction. So you, you need to appreciate this, that these components, models, pipelines, LLM applications are built in that iterative way. Um, so yes, so you know, uh, both angles show you really need to be a very modern product manager uh, to really be able to succeed with AI. Okay, so well, there's a couple of things there I want to I, I, I want to probe on, but uh, just for for anybody uh, that's that's watching, if you've got any questions, please do put them in the chat. 
Um, we'll get to them. We're, we're, we're glad to have you here. Um, any questions about uh, what Milos or myself um, is saying, please let us know. Um, and, and yeah, so Milos, I think that that we we we've spoken about this a bit, and I guess one of the questions is is if say I'm in publishing, um, what sort of where might I be able to hire people that have the right skills to to understand this? Where should I be looking? Should I be looking outside uh, the normal um, uh, set of people that I would be? uh you know looking to hire in terms of of, of that that ownership or yeah wh wh where can i find people that that have a product mindset i guess that's the 64 million dollar question <laughs> uh i would say you know um organizations that want to adopt ai right in the end you don't need you probably don't need someone who that you definitely don't need someone um, who worked at Haste uh, at DeepSet, you know, and worked maybe on you know being a pro product manager for Haystack or for the DeepSet Cloud platform. You probably also you're not looking, yeah, you know, you're not looking for someone who is just very talented in this AI feature. You you need someone who understands your existing product quite well and your existing users, mm -hmm. and who can somehow you know bridge the gap from uh, from from technological capabilities with AI into these existing products. So I think if you're looking for a great product manager for this, first of all, maybe you already have great product managers, then you should think about how to educate those. Yeah? Um, if you are looking for someone to do this for you, first and foremost, just look for a great product manager, right? Because this is still what you need. In the end, it's just a feature in your whole, um, in your whole application. Now, the question though is, well, if I have great product managers, but they're not familiar with AI features, what should I do and how can I get them there, right? Because this is yep. not a fair point because we are, we are having great product managers all over the world because there are plenty of great products. I would still say, given the whole awareness around Gen AI and LLMs, the actual adoption and our usage day to day outside of chat GPT and maybe some, you know, some applications it's still quite low, right? I mean, I think we're talking about 4% 4, 4 of production usage of LLMs. And I would even argue that this is probably an, a bit of an overestimate. Okay. So what you have to do is I think you have to expose product managers to the technology in the sense that let them ship something and then let them deal with what's happening then, then mm -hmm. right? So um the big problem we're seeing is that right now with this new technology, many companies are looking into conceptualization. So again, they're approaching it like, you know, in a waterfall world where you okay. say, oh, let's plan this out. And this is the first step. And let's think about how this can look like in our product. And then they spend like six, nine, 12 months. Then they develop it. Then they ship. And then big disappointment. This AI didn't make sense. The product failed. We shipped. I think the best thing you can do is if you have a great product manager, who can iterate, who can appreciate that products, best products are built by iterating over customers, let them ship something, but in the same time, let give them the space to experiment. This means don't go there after month one and ask, what is the ROI on our AI feature? What's, you know, how, 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 how much higher is our engagement? You know, this is something that's your end goal. That's the North star, but you have to leave space for learning for these people, you know, to ship out, I really, to I think a, a, a really nice example there, one of the German automotive companies, unfortunately, I, I can't reveal who they are. I've been trying to persuade them to let me tell the story <laughs> because I think it's a, a really good one. But, I, I, you know, obviously, given where you're located and probably some of the people uh, on the call, uh, yeah, German automotive companies are all becoming more digital. Um, you know, the punch in the face there, I guess, is coming from Elon Musk. So everyone is really trying to build up their digital muscle. And I think a great example is, is, is the company had originally begun thinking about, well, just how could we use um, uh, AI to improve access to our documentation? So they, and, and or, you know, technical docs for um, their, their, their people in the field that were repairing cars, frankly. And so yeah. it was, you know, I, if I could just ask the question and it would respond, have you looked at this 
uh, you know, have you you looked at this part of the, I, I'm I'm not much of a car person. This is you're going to quickly find out on the example, but it's still a good example. <laughs> so they, they, yeah. they were basically because technical documentation is is a great opportunity for natural language processing. That's one of the things that that you know I'm excited about in space. Anyway, so but what they realized when they started to do that that there was another opportunity because the people that they were working with um, in the field turned around and said, well, one of the questions that we regularly like to ask is what they ask the customer when the customer comes in the car, what noise is it making? Mm -hmm. So the, the car is making, oh, it's making a funny knocking. Oh, you know, I'm hearing a at this, you know, whatever the, the thing is. And so what they, they realized was that it, when they were engaging and they'd rolled out something to the people in the field, that actually there was another opportunity here. So now what they've done um, is like a Shazam for weird noises in cars. So they basically started to collect um, samples of the noises that their cars make and have used, mm. begun to use that as part of the diagnostics process. And I think in terms of your, your, your point about you need to get started in order that you can realize what the opportunities are and actually get things in people's hands, I think that's an example. I think it's a brilliant um, use case. 100%, right? Like, absolutely. And I think, you know, um, uh, you see, like, they started with one idea and ended up with a different one. Everything is AI, right? Technologically, you know, it's it's somehow both in the same space, but the actual feature simply differs. It looks different, right? And I think this is um, this is really what... Um, what we... Uh, what we... You know, what, what I was referring to, right? So... But again, you need to leave space for this iteration. If you, if they would have planned, you know, a massive rollout, you know, building the feature and then mm -hmm. getting uh, getting it out to thirty thousand workshops all over the country, and it doesn't work, it fails. You're iterating away. You know, then it's a fail. You know how it works. People will look at it. Um, they will be grumpy. They will say we spent so much money, um, and people don't like it. Mm -hmm. If you start, let's start with free workshops. Let's give them the feature, the product in an early version. Let's iterate from that. Let's see what what they really need. Let's see how it really becomes sticky and then grow out from there. You know, it's pretty much like, it sounds a bit like the lean startup idea, but I think for, for AI, it's really, really important because people need to get the habit to iterate over AI features and need to get the habit, you know, what to look into and all of these things. It's simply, <laughs> it is a very fresh field. Also like from a scientific standpoint, it's, it's somehow new. And so, um and yeah that's that's why get it get it out into the hands of the pms and let them let them make failures give them give them so i think that's, that, that's really right i mean uh, most of the companies i deal with are in fact technology companies and so we've got a question from uh ronald batelio um is data analytics an ideal route into ai and and it's certainly looking like one of the good routes so a good example um if we think um systems observability uh, is a, a subset, a specialist subset of data analytics. Some of the really interesting, right from, for, you know, because this year, every single technology company that came to us from January onwards uh, wanted to talk about AI. There was a lot of AI washing. Um, but but some of the things that were real, we very quickly realized in the uh, observability space. And, and you know, over time, um, we saw delivery uh, from the likes of, of Honeycomb, um, uh, I've seen some very interesting from uh, technology from Elastic. If you think about not everybody is an expert in query languages, one of the opportunities and one of the things that, I mean, A, with analytics, um, you, you, you are in a position where if I can, with natural language, ask a question towards your analytics and visualization without having to be an expert in the query language, it opens up the the number of people that might be using the product um and you know it, it, it it's it, that is that is an area that we've seen and uh, again uh it was no accident that that amazon q which i mentioned one of the the first use cases that they mentioned was why not use q in order to uh, build your dashboards in order to um query your your data sets and you know then you want to use ai to you, you want it to be an enriched experience um, where you can add further value, but the the the, the, the sort of as a first step, uh, uh, some of the companies thought, well, hang on a minute. Given that these LLMs are quite good at generating code, query languages is one of the the opportunities there. So I think data analytics um, mm -hmm. is 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 a pretty good route. 
um, into taking advantage of AI, at least in that use case. Uh, Milos, any thoughts on data analytics mm -hmm. as as one of the um, spaces that mm -hmm. you know where AI can provide value? Um, so um, definitely, and what you're saying is, I think, a, an an ideal example of of how you can actually somehow democratize the access to data, right? So there is all of this data, and you know. Um, you, you you said it yourself. Big data was a big thing. A lot of Hadoop data warehouses, um, billions have been spent, right, to consolidate and normalize data and make it like have data. Another question. The next question is, what does that mean? How how can we make it accessible? So I think uh, analytics use cases are great use cases. Um, to Ronald's question, um, because I can when I look at it, it reads. I could also read it like if it's if it's myth, like if the if the technology or like the the methods from analytics are somehow a good route into into the into into the methods that that are needed for AI. I think uh, in general, yes, right, because somehow there is uh, to both there is some mathematical statistical foundation. Mm -hmm. I think with data analytics, you know, the benefit you have is it's. Mm, you can probably rather succeed by approaching a data analytics project uh, in a waterfall way, and you cannot succeed, I think, very rare cases by doing this with an AI project because you know data analytics is just what do you want to see, which metrics, yeah. which KPIs do you want to see, and that's what you calculate based on the data that you're having. That's more or less it. You just like it or don't like it. Um, but also, but I it's think not it's way scary more because deterministic. analytics is not. Maybe not as scary to some people as what they would consider the application. Yeah, exactly. I think I think it's of course, of course, it's more like uh, as you say, yeah, it's it's um it's um it's not scary. It's it's simply yeah. I think yeah, I think AI AI still has a little bit of a flavor of being magical. And to be fair, proprietary model providers probably amplify this a little bit right because they are like uh very yeah i mean it's secret we don't know what's under the hood and then you know yeah uh, once in a while people talk about agi whatever we understand or mean with agi it's i i still feel it's like for me it's not properly defined i'm not, so. I'm not worried that god is in the machine yet i've got to admit but there are points to be wary of i think one thing as i went through my slides i'm like wow these sound really negative i didn't mean but there there, there, there are real issues i think um and and the the issue of hallucination i should imagine to your customers uh and to people uh building these applications um you know that 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 is a concern so if i'm a a product owner and uh, tell me what 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 is retrieval augmented generation and and how is that mm -hmm. going to be able how is that something that i'm going to feel more confident in deploying applications uh to to end users without without hallucinating so um <clears throat> so to explain rack um properly i i usually like to talk about the function of the model right so um because if you look at something like ChatGPT, if you don't use the plugins or anything like this, if you just look at ChatGPT, the way it was released one year ago, um, the model had two functions. Number one was you type in your question, who won the Soccer World Cup last year? And the model understands, okay, you're interested in Soccer World Cup last year, understood. And the second option is that the model serves as a knowledge base. This means after it understood what you're looking for, it's looking for that information within its own knowledge. So it is technically, you could say, two functions. Interpret what the user wants and look in your knowledge base what you know about this demand. Um, and this is where the problem comes in, right? Because how the knowledge is stored in the model is something that we can hardly assess. We can hardly say, you know, which connections are made and, you know, this is something that becomes very hard to control because we're mm -hmm. talking about trillions of parameters and we don't even know what's behind it. So this is very, very hard to control. And this is where this term hallucination comes from because often the knowledge that is called and that is queried within this these nodes, these weights, 
is um, is pretty skewed when you construct it. Now, rack means let's take the model, but let's only make use of this, you know, interpretation function. Let's not make use of any knowledge this model has seen, but just use the capabilities of the model to understand, hey, um, look, this user wants to know who won the World Cup last year. Mm -hmm. And then don't let the model search in its own knowledge, right? That again, we don't know how it was constructed and we don't know if it can probably reconstruct an answer, but just let it look for it in a knowledge base you define, you own, you control, you update, right? As an owner of this full rack system. And this is in the end, um, this is in the end the key difference, I would say, between rack and like, let's say, just using the knowledge from the LLM. Now, uh, probably you're wondering now, so what does this have to do with retrieval? Um, well, what we do is we cannot give all, or it's not effective to use all of, let's say Wikipedia, if you if you ask the question who won the World Cup last, the soccer World Cup last year, it's not very effective to hand over all Wikipedia with I don't know all articles of Nietzsche and Churchill and the Queen and whatever to the model to look for this answer. Right? Actually, it would be enough to just filter for everything that has to do with soccer and probably even with World Cup, right? And probably even something that has only to do with the last year. So you narrow it down, and you're very selective in the knowledge you hand over to the model in mm -hmm. the moment of this query. And this will lift up your answer quality, reduce the risk of hallucinations if this retrieval is properly done. Um, and uh, this is why RAC is a very effective way to A, make use of LLMs on your own data, right? So it's not just avoiding hallucinations, but actually making usable and proprietary data that hopefully is not part of any pre-training process, right? Or it's not crawlable in the, in the web. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same time, you can also control control the output way better. And this is this is this is um why we think Rack is great and this is the key difference. Interesting because I, I thought that was one of the, the the slightly odd things about when they launched Q and they, they kept saying this this contains 17 years of you know data about Amazon systems. And I'm like, well what that I don't know how useful that is because <laughs> I mean you know SQS in, in 2007 or whatever was kind of different from how it is now. So it's a, yeah, I I I think they've probably yeah. got some some work to do in really thinking about what needs to be in the data set and what doesn't to make the product more effective. It it again, it depends on how you use it, right? If you believe, um, um, if you think back when you went to school, right? So um, probably I can't remember that that far. <laughs> I can't remember that far ago, Milo. <laughs> but you see, the, the 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 language you used back then in school is probably still somewhat a similar language that you're using yeah. today, right? So the core semantics, the core the core semantics of language are somewhat stable. So this means we can use this old data and the history books we all read in school that are like you know centuries old to to train models to understand language. The problem is, are we also using this training data? as the knowledge and the knowledge base where we get the information out that we are actually looking for when we interact with the model, right? And this is this is the only difference. And this is where REC is a very effective way of using the language understanding and semantic understanding capabilities of the model, but not making use of the knowledge base that is kind of a byproduct, right? That have, that comes out of this because you train it. So there is some knowledge somewhere on that. Okay, yeah, so we've, we've, got a, we've got someone interested in failure here. Um, Dragan mm -hmm. Sundika asks, uh, are you are, are we already seeing LLM based projects and products failing? If so, what are the common reasons or let's say most common challenges? Um, I've mm -hmm. actually, I think, probably provided a couple of examples in, in my intro. I don't know whether it's I don't think it's failure in the long term, but there are. Um, yes, the the the, you know, um, things like hallucination, um, leaking of corporate trade secrets is generally not. Uh, considered helpful but but in terms of your customers what yeah. are some of the things and let maybe a little get back to that ownership question how does yeah. Yeah. what are the implications of ownership and mm -hmm. managing managing product projects and products i think that the ultimate failure is you know um that you don't manage to ship a feature into production now um 
that is a very common failure right now. So not even being able to ship it. And then probably, you know, a second failure mode. But I would argue that many companies aren't there yet because they didn't, you know, they didn't they didn't ship in production yet is being unsuccessful in production, right? So not not achieving ROI goals or business case targets um after let's say one or two years being running that feature. But first thing is we're not ending up in production, right? And now uh, what's the reason for that? I think um again plenty of those. Number one, we have AI in a separate silo. So AI is AI. We're building playgrounds. Um great engineers are you know providing playgrounds for you know the, whoever in the end, right? In order to explore the technology and you know somehow understand what can we do with the technology, but it's not really linked to a business outcome. I think this is a common failure more mode. This is exactly what we're talking about. No product ownership, full product ownership anywhere and nearby the people and the money spent on AI. I think this mm -hmm. is a very common failure mode. So this this silos. The second thing is of course also that the let's say these two are in place, right? Let's say the AI engineering teams are working on a product with the product manager, then I would say the problem is also often the expectation or the belief that just the feature, just the AI, you know, is enough. It's not enough. So you will end up with a great AI system, great LLM system. Again, the technological capabilities are there. What we see with ChatGPT is possible. This is somewhat state of the art. We can do it. We can use open AI. We can use open source models, whatever we want. And we can probably get to something like this for our use cases. So technologically, it's not the problem anymore. You can get there. Maybe in two weeks, maybe in two months, but mm -hmm. you will get there. But um, the, the the second big break point is we don't know how to make use of that feature in our product because it's not just a magic widget maybe that will lead to engagement and to user love and to usage. You know, maybe we have to rethink our whole actual product where we built this into. And I think this is this is a second failure mode that we're observing that actually companies are a bit disappointed because, oh, we launched the AI feature, but it's not going through the roof. Uh, yeah. Again, under understanding this iteration. And then I think the third one is mm, act actually being able to ship something, but not doing that, not following a proper the proper life cycle of the application, right? Because um, you mentioned hallucinations. I give you one idea. If you are, uh, I don't know, if you are, uh, if you are, if you're a publisher again. Let's take the publishers or whoever you want. What if someone is stress testing your AI bot? What if someone is asking a mean question, a racist question, something around, you know, right. sexist question, whatever it is? You want to control for that, right? You want to make sure that these pipelines react uh, um, uh, properly. That they probably don't even don't even give answers or you know, or yeah, whatever. So you you have you have to be careful and you somehow have to manage outputs as much as possible. And this means you know it's not just a pure infrastructure problem. It's not enough to just take an infrastructure API or to just take an open source project like Haystack or Langchain or whatever, build your application and ship. If you're really talking about, I don't know, large scale enterprise grade deployments. You need some control in that process. You need visibility around the quality. You want to run some early end user tests. You want to, uh, you 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 know, you want to run some edge cases on it. These are all things you have to do. You need a proper AI software development process that again looks different from a classic CI/CD pipeline that you maybe use for other software. And this is also something where we see, you know, people shipping stuff and saying, "Oh my God!" But well, we have to control for hallucinations and we have to control for, I don't know, hate speech and whatever. I think this is too much effort. It's not, it's doable. You need proper tooling, you need proper products in the pure do-it-yourself manner. You cannot get there for sure, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you need to set yourself up with the right products, tools, infrastructure, and platforms. Um, and this is another common failure model. On that note, so we've got a failure. great great question from Marcello Barreto. Um, would retrieval augmented generation apply to large vision models or is it just LLMs or small language models? This is quite a technical. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. I think so. I, I think so. I think it does. I think I think it should be doable, right? That you um that you that you use REC also for for image generation. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a question. I have no I'm, idea. I'm 
I'm I'm I'm I'm a bit of, yeah I'm I'm a, I'm a bit embarrassed now because um, I probably should have should, should know uh, you see our focus is pretty much still like text and actually SQL data <laughs> so talking about yeah. structured data and data analytics but um, I mean, I'm quite I'm quite sure it it also works for for vision because there's certainly some interesting stuff going on at the moment um, in the field where um, you know we've seen obviously one of the really exciting applications of um, these these uh you know these models is is image generation and yeah. uh so adobe firefly has uh is beginning to turn out some really amazing results and if you think about adobe's business of, with designers and or stock photography huge implications there mid journey um stable diffusion this image generation is super interesting but there are some artists that are now Pretty unhappy because they feel that their work is being consumed um, without proper credit and or models in which they might be paid. So now um, there are uh, some technologies that are being that basically you can sort of put a it's kind of like a watermark, but it messes up uh, if somebody tries to generate an image based on uh, when they've sucked that image in. So that's a whole. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm I, I'm not the expert in that, but I, I think there's going to be quite an interesting sort of adversarial um, and, and not adversarial in the sense of adversarial training, but an, an adversarial uh, model there between copyright holders and others. It's interesting. We've had a question about AI governance. Mm -hmm. so we'll get a bit mm -hmm. to that. But yeah. I guess they're related. Two other good questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, the 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 a really interesting conversation um with um the chief product officer of um gitlab and he had been discussing with a prospect uh th them using gitlab's uh code generation tool and uh the the customer said well literally they explicitly said is it is is your code generation based on open ai and it was only when they said, no, it, it wasn't, that the customer said, okay, good, that means we might consider it. So questions mm -hmm. about, um, you know, I, I think open source um, as a model are, are quite quite valid because we can't, it, a lot of people are just going to default to open AI because it's there and it's very convenient. But for some organizations, they, they maybe have some other concerns. Also just a huge amount of innovation on the open uh, models that we're seeing sort of week after week there's a new one launched uh github has a couple of great lists by the way um uh of uh there's an awesome list of of commercial um open source llms but so isabel's is asking should organizations be betting on open source rather than proprietary models milos mm -hmm. what do you think mm -hmm. um <clears throat> let me uh, so you're speaking to someone who's obviously an, an open, a strong open source believer. Because uh, before we had a proper commercial product, we started with an open source product, right? Um, so uh, that being said, I'm definitely there's definitely some skew towards uh, being open source, right? Um, in general, look in general, the mental model I apply to open source and why something needs to be open source is mostly. Um, you know, when, when I think about core technologies like databases, for example, right, and I want to rely on the database standard, usually I would always prefer an open source database, right, because in the end, an open source database is somehow, you know, made, made the race, right? So what's the reason for that? Well, if I store my data and I query my data from somewhere, I want to understand what's happening with my data, right, to a certain degree. And I think this is somehow the implicit reason why data processing technologies, databases are usually open source, right? Because we want to understand what does Spark when it distributes my compute, right? What does Hadoop when it processes everything in a batch? What 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 is actually happening here? And I think this is this is um, where there's this desire for open source. Um, now that being said, I think it's fair to assume that open source models will really bounce back um, and that we will see in enterprises where we where this I want to know paradigm is essential, right? And that there will always be a preference to rather lean towards an open source model where I can read about a few papers on that model, 
where I have benchmarks, where I know what it has been trained on, right? Where I know where I can maybe even like deploy it, you know, on my cloud instance in my VPC, mm -hmm. where I know that the data is not, you know, going to a third party provider or even just the feedback, right? So I think there's there's a big value to it. Now, that being said, open AI models are, and I know there was a paper yesterday that looked into it, but like in general, if I think about, you know, the, the classic use case in an enterprise setup and you want to get started and you want to use something, an open AI model is in performance simply very hard to beat because they are really, really good. This is something uh, I have to admit, right? So the quality is not really matched yet, uh, um, how I see it, mm, at least not with these general capabilities, right? Because we're probably like open AI is a model you have to prompt. So it does everything you want. So if you if you try everything you want, you will be on average better off with open AI than with an open source version. That might be different for specialized models, but we can talk about this in a second. Um, I think though, look, Quality getting quickly started. Open AI is great. You can you know you can just validate does that work at all. Mm -hmm. I think there is a strong tendency towards being independent. I mean, look what happened with Open AI a few weeks ago, right? This was, I mean, the organ it wasn't clear. The organization might have shut down, right? A few days. Yeah, yeah, it really wasn't. We, we, we wouldn't know. So, at all. so that means like it's it's also there's also a vendor risk to a certain degree here, but um, in the end. Um, you know, uh, it's good to get started with it. If you really think about sustainably being in production and like I leave all cost considerations aside, um, I would expect that most enterprises will opt for open source models uh, um, and be fine to probably tune their applications a bit more, invest a bit more in the development, have more narrow applications uh, um, in order to somehow match the performance um, just for you know being able to understand what's happening as much as we can understand it right so but have transparency on what is used and what is happening um i think I, this is our perspective and, and this is also something that we're seeing so in the enterprise i don't think that proprietary models are dominating at and all. also just the, the power of these models they some of the open source models and you know running on you know like running on a local laptop um you know certainly one of the Apple machines, extremely fast and capable now. Um, yeah, the models are, I, I think it's just been very interesting to see this this horse race, where mm -hmm. to your point, I mean, obviously OpenAI has access to more GPUs than probably anyone else on the planet at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, but the yeah, increasingly, just the performance of, you know, commodity models and, and, and open source models is, extremely impressive and i i think we'll expect that to continue so yeah. isabel i i think that would be uh Milosh's take is that um uh yeah the the w weirdly the guy that's got an open source model thinks open source models are the way forward but, but <laughs> i mean um, maybe just just to add briefly on this you know i think um um it is also point you raise small language models right so um a model, you know, a model like like GPT three point five, GPT four, you need to prompt it, right? So there are many many capabilities, and you define out of those capabilities what are you doing for me, model, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at most enterprise use cases, um, you actually you actually rarely have you know have have a need for this freedom of choice, right? What you do is you usually have one prompt that yep. the model is executing answer questions in a customer support bot, write summaries, propose contract snippets, whatever, you know, in a legal space. And once you are fixing actually what the model does, you know, the question is, do I need all of these neurons, right, <laughs> in my model? Um, or is there maybe something lightweight, more specialized? And I think this is pretty much what we're also believing in. And the moment we talk about smaller models, we, I think this is where, you know, open source again, actually, is um is a true alternative where we can and will see open source models being on par um uh, with with proprietary models like the open AI models simply because as you mentioned it the compute requirements to train them to evaluate them to iterate over them are simply way lower and also to run them of course but um all of that is lower and that means you know there are more more people and more communities that can actually work on those um so yeah, so I think I think yeah, this is just, probably just a trend we're, we're seeing new interesting models emerge on a you know 
a weekly, if not daily basis. The amount of innovation is just incredible, I think. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we're not quite at the end of the hour, but but we're, you know, we're getting close to wrapping up. But um, another question from Ronald Abateo, which is, could you expand on AI governance and AI intellectual rights? So this is just lots and lots of, of issues here um, to be considered. I mean, certainly on copyright, um, it has been uh, very interesting to see all of the major vendors, essentially, but Microsoft was out there first. Amazon has done this as well now. Google's in there, has said that they will indemnify. I If um, you are uh, building something and somebody then comes and sues you because something from someone else's copyrighted work ends up in your product, they will they will defend that in court. And I think that the expectation is they'll be doing it on the basis of 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 fair use um, in, in terms of these systems. So certainly it, it, it's, you know, they must have had some very interesting discussions with their lawyers uh, when they offer to indemnify anyone, or perhaps, for example, if you're writing software um, and the code is generated by GitHub Copilot, um, that 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 if uh, there was a legal case because software was discovered that that impinged on someone's copyright, they they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna defend that um, and and indemnify you. I think that's tremendously interesting. For me, I've been thinking about what I call an AI bill of materials because with these models, what are we feeding them with? We're you know we're seeing the EU has begun to. Um, move towards legislation that says actually you do need a list of any copyrighted works that go in to um, the models. On on that note, indemnification aside, we've seen uh, court cases in the U.S. where authors um, are 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 going after the AI companies because basically um, people have just created corpuses of copyrighted works and then they 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 were used to to build the models. Um, uh, so yeah, copyright I think is important, but but yeah, provenance which is associated with that because we really need a sort of um, you know, we want to know what we want to know what we're consuming, uh, you know, at an enterprise level. It, it it's very worrying to just adopt a, a black box. Um, so I I've been yeah talking about air but bill of materials the same as when you go in the supermarket, and it says you know what the ingredients are and how much sugar and fat and everything else, just so you can have. Um, uh, this is, uh, yeah, just so the, the, you can have a sense of, um, what's going on. It's not clear, Ronald, that citing the reference is good enough. Um, and I think this gets to the question of, of fair use. So I think that that's almost a, a, a separate issue. It's great to know. And I think that's one of the approaches we've seen Microsoft adopting where rather than it just packaging everything up and, and, and presenting uh, an answer. It's good to have a citation, um, but yeah, the 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 I, I think one of the questions there is how much of the material was used um, to to feed the model, uh, and 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 this is stuff we're still working out. I, I think on uh, again on the this AI bill of materials question, it's interesting. The U.S. Department of Defense has recently put out an RFP um, using that same language. Just the point. Yeah, and in fact, I spoke to uh, probably can't identify them, but a French um, aeronautical uh, aer aerospace supplier, and again, they were like, "Well, we can't use models if we really don't know what it was trained on, um, and and whether we can have transparency and some sort of replicable results." So I I think this is stuff we're all still working on, um, and it, it's a very uh, good question. Um, Right, Milos, we we you know I, I think we, we we probably need to wrap up. Final thoughts on uh, product management. You know we talked about some of the other issues, partly driven by the questions for everyone. Thank you for those questions, by the way, folks. Um, but yeah, like what? How are we going to be more effective so that we can move forward quickly and safely uh, in 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 a world of AI uh, driven digital services? So final words and summing up from you mm -hmm. sir um i would say um start like sh ship ship small but ship <laughs> yeah uh, it's not about it's not about achieving uh industry disrupting rois it's about getting into a habit of shipping and i think this, this should be the top priority of companies so 
when they when they look into what they're doing, I think the core question should be, is what we're doing fast enough to get something into production? Even if it is something that you just share with five users, five internal users, I think that should be the goal of every every organization. And this is gonna form the habit of adopting and building um, AI powered products. Um, so I think this is really the core um, move to production. Don't look too much into ROIs right now, right now. Um, prefer shipping and velocity of shipping. Um, and yeah, on the governance and safe part, define what's safe for you. And then make sure that you also have the systems in place, the products in place, the tools in place, because there's tons of that out there to, um, to, you know, to follow your own governance. I think this is right now the, the, the key question. And, um, yeah, um, opt for open source whenever you can. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. Well, uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, if you have any further questions, I would really highly recommend uh, talking to my friends uh, at DeepSet. Um, they'll be only too happy to uh, answer any inquiries that you have. Um, yep. I'm, I'm, I'm James Governor from Redmonk, research and advisory company looking at pra practitioner driven Technology adoption, um, Milos Rusic, and yeah, um, I, I, I'm uh, you know grateful that you uh, turned up today. So, and uh, thank you very much, Ronald. We like a bit of positive feedback. Thank you. This was very informative. I'll take it. And um, on that note, thanks so much. Have a great uh, evening if you're in Europe, or a, a nice afternoon if you're in the US, or have a good night if you're over there in Asia. Thank you. Thanks. It was a pleasure. Um, happy to connect over LinkedIn or whatever, email, whatever it is. Um, yeah, looking forward to to questions and conversations. And thanks, James, uh, for for this. It was fun. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye.